Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I get a confirmation that um, everyone can hear us, please? Great. So it looks like we've confirmed that the voice transmission is fine. It uh, We do have the group meeting in our office. And just today, because of logistics reason, we are just webinaring from the office. And um, so those of you that uh, would like to come down and visit us, please do. Uh, we'll continue doing that. So um, what I'm going to be doing today is there's two... Um, two uh, sort of interesting toppings that have come up. Um, and um, uh, as usual, if you, uh, if you have any questions, please do feel free to type it in and I'll sort of get to it. And we, I, I have two monitors too, so I'm not ignoring to look at the camera. I have to sort of make sure I get the answers and questions um, all at the same time. Um, so recently I've had uh, some questions asked specifically by patients who've seeked our help about the topic of interception, um, interception. So uh, I would like to go ahead and spend a little time talking about this. Um, in the next few slides, we're going to talk about what interception is, uh, what causes it, um, the symptoms, diagnosis, and some of the treatment options. Um, uh, interception is essentially telescoping of the bowel into itself. Um, most of the time this happens in uh, distal small bowel or it happens between the small bowel and the colon where the small bowel enters uh, into the um, ascending colon on the right side of the abdomen. Um, uh, into uh, um, the terminal ileum. And uh, what this essentially uh, means is um, the, the bowel itself can slide into a segment of it and that double narrowing may be causing the problem. Um, in a susception is uh, usually frequently seen um, other than what we're gonna talk about today in children and that has to do with the location of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the GI motility that uh, is a problem. So usually if a, if a newborn or, or a baby shows up in an emergency room with sort of nausea and vomiting and uh, sort of colicky abdominal pain and they're having uh, no bowel movements and passing gas, then we have to suspect interception um, and then we'll rule that out and go from there. Um, the uh, cause of uh, interception are uh, described uh, on the second slide, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, there has to be a focal point. There has to be a, a, a segment of the small bowel where the motility, the forward movement motility of the um, small bowel doesn't allow it to go all the way through. And so if you think of it as a snake that has to, be, uh, that has to push the food through, and uh, as our GI tract is a long conduit that will push the, uh, push the food through, if for whatever reason there's a break um, either at the signal processing that the, 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 the nerve endings don't pass the information and or there's a mechanical problem why the information, why the bowel is not able to push it through, then you can get that focal point, that focus where the bowel may start folding on itself. So one of those places may be adhesion, scar tissue, Anastomosis, uh, a, a common thing that we have to always think about is tumor. Um, interesting enough, where it isn't that cannot be explained, AIDS patients tend to um, have statistically higher chance of having a susception than general population. Again, we're talking something that's very rare, but even in that subset of patient population, it's um, high. And motility issues, as I described in, in 
cases where there's there, there's thought process as to the bowel bowels motility the, the motility of the bowel is inhibited. Um, uh, I just want to take a second here to describe uh, to sort of outline one of the things that happens that there's um, there are multiple sort of pacemakers of the GI tract and one of them starts in the stomach and there's a there, there there's a second set that is thought to start from the distal small bowel where that distal small bowel will send a signal approximately say uh, you know to, to sort of promote the GI content being pushed down. Um, there is a potential where, with the transection of the small bowel, where uh, that that signal transferred from the distal part of the small bowel proximally may be inhibited, and that may be contributing to some of the uh, uh, increase in reception that's been seen in adult patients having having surgery. Even though I I think I have an explanation as to why we see this in subset of some patients done by some practices and not others uh, per se. Um, so when it comes to specifically about a focal point, I want to sort of show this uh, real quickly. There, when we, uh, specifically in the gastric bypass or the duodenal switch operation where we set up, um, uh, uh, when we're setting this up for a, um, um, uh, anastomosis, then, um, what we have to do is, uh, uh, we hook up the two bowels in a side-by-side -side, uh, format. So on this drawing, on the one on the right-hand side, you can see there's a small bowel that comes down and uh, the one on the left, sort of the letter Y, for example. And the blue arrows uh, show that the, the direction by which the bowel the, is doing its peristalsis movement. So the bowel on the left-hand side um, I don't know if you can uh, see the mouse or not, but the, the bowel on the left-hand side is peristalsing, sort of moving forward. The one on the right is moving forward, and they join forces, and they go down this way. Now, there are sometimes uh, in cases where for some technical reason or, 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 or whatever reason, surgeons may connect the bowel whereby one the direction of the Anastomosis itself is opposite to the direction of the the peristalsis where it's going in. So in this case, the bowel is hooked up in a way where the peristalsis is pushing up. On this bowel, it's pushing it down, and then the food joins and goes down this way. It, it'd be very easy to, to appreciate that there's a potential for when the bowel is itself trying to peristalsis into something, and because of the fact that these two bowel are going opposite to each other, an inner susception may occur right at that junction, whereby this bowel may push itself, telescope itself to the um, loop of the bowel where the, where the um, peristalsis was opposite. Um, interestingly enough, we had, um, uh, you know, Going back, I think it was 2004, where uh, we published on this many years ago how, in our opinion, the proper way of bowel anastomosis should be done in order to avoid interception. And this can be done laparoscopically. Um, and um, these hand drawings show um, where the two bowel has to be placed next to each other in the same direction you make the opening and you fire the staplers from both sides. The point being that as we go from A through F, the direction of the peristalsis is always from left to right, left to right. And when you're done stapling, still left to right. So if let's say the, the left side of our slide is the proximal GI tract and the right side is the distal small GI tract, the food and the GI content will continuously go from left to right in both limbs in the same direction. Unlike um, this drawing, where you will have the peristalsis forcing the food or the GI tract in opposing direction, potentially causing a focus where the peristalsis can occur. Um, the treatment options are, um, uh, at least in pediatric patients, has been described to be non-surgical early on, and the treatment for that is, if you can imagine a telescope where one side has been uh, pushed into the, uh, 
the larger caliber valve. So if you can somehow create higher pressure on the inner susceptible valve, you may be able to push the telescope back out. And the way you do that for a pediatric patient population would be CT scan with uh, or, or barium enema, uh, but it needs to be done with contrast, where the contrast placed into the rectum will reflux into the small bowel and then increase the pressure distal to the bowel where the inner, inner susception has occurred, and then will sort of push the bowel out and reduce the inner susception. Um, the, the, interesting enough, there's some uh, description of this having uh, uh, been able to be accomplished by just pumping air into the rectum where you can sort of increase the pressure and then push the uh, inner susceptible bowel out. Um, in adult population, however, surgery tends to be the way to go. Um, laparoscopic ear laparotomy, if this is suspected, and we can talk about it uh, into how you address this, um, uh, the underlying problem needs to be resolved. So if there is any focus of um, point focus on the small bowel where the bowel may sli uh, slide on itself, then what needs to be done is that focal point needs to be corrected, even if it means that there's, a pay there's an anastomosis that uh, in a uh, antiperistaltic direction where the two bowels come together in an opposing direction, then... Uh, this needs to be resected and placed in a way the peristalsis goes in the same direction in order to avoid the enveloping or telescoping of the one loop of bowel into the next one. Um, the, uh, the, there has been some descriptions and some uh, concept of uh, applying, uh, you know, providing some medications to relax the bowels and so forth and so on. I, I, don't, I can't find any scientific evidence for that where actually any um, bowel uh, relaxing medications work. Um, how, how do you uh, diagnose uh, inner susception? So I think we need to start by saying that whether we're talking about general population or weight loss surgical patient population, the typical symptoms for interception is that of a bowel obstruction. Uh, it may present with, depending on how far down the, the small bowel the obstruction is, this may be acute nausea and vomiting, patient not passing gas, having no bowel movements, unless the patient had the duodenal switch or gastric bypass operation where some and not all of the symptoms may not be present, and this will require the patients to have a high index of suspicion. Um, um, this is because of the fact that with the duodenal switch and gastric bypass procedures, there's two parallel limbs coming down. And if you have actually inner susception on the part of the bowel that's right at the junction of the biliopancreatic and alimentary limb, depending on which bowel is inner susceptible in one, which one, you may have a picture where the patient may have nausea or vomiting, but not having any issues with passing gas or having bowel movement. And that may confuse the clinician's suspicion of bowel obstruction. And you may be treated for, you know, gastritis or flu or what have you, where in fact you may actually have an inner susception and not being diagnosed because no one is really thinking about it. Now, um, as a bariatric surgeon, inner susception is not the first thing that comes to my mind when I see a patient that may, I may suspect bowel obstruction. But once I go down the path of trying to work the patient up for a suspected bowel obstruction, more likely than not, this diagnosis will be picked up. Um, uh, the, uh, so if you have a inner susception of the biliopancreatic into the alimentary limb versus the alimentary limb into the biliopancreatic limb, you will have uh, some of these components of the nausea, vomiting, not having any bowel movements, and having crampy abdominal pain, for example, be absent, complicating the diagnostic um, uh, thought process. From a diagnostic point of view, the way to diagnose a suspected uh, inner susception, and I'll take one step back and say, in order to diagnose a bowel obstruction in a patient with a uh, history of uh, weight loss surgery, the standard is a CT scan of the abdomen with um, oral and IV contrast. Getting a CT scan of the abdomen with no oral contrast in a weight loss surgical patient is worthless unless you're trying to diagnose kidney stones. No patient with um, 
history of weight loss surgery. No patient with history of weight loss surgery should have their abdomen evaluated for any intra-abdominal pathology without oral contrast. I, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's very important that as patients we become proactive in that notion that if in the unlikely when we end up in emergency room, that whoever is ordering the CT scan is clear that they will not be able to distinguish between the alimentary and the biliopancreatic limb unless you have oral contrast, in which case if you do not have oral contrast, diagnosis of bowel obstruction for whatever cause may be lost and it may not be picked up unless it may be too late. Um, we already talked about the trip, uh, treatment options. And so I'm going to uh, sort of show a uh, couple of images here. The one on the right-hand side, you can see how one loop of, uh, one length of the small bowel has telescoped itself into the other one and essentially has uh, sort of uh, slipped into the distal small bowel. And as it uh, slips into the small bowel, it causes narrowing it could, because of the swelling and the bowel obstruction. Um, there's also the, the picture on the left-hand side of your slide also shows shows similar thing. Um, just sort of a tad bit from a surgical perspective, when you see this, the tendency would be, well, I'll just grab the twins and sort of pull them apart and I'll sort of reduce it. And that's how you rip the bowel. The way you, re you fix the interception is always try to milk it backward to push the intercepted bowel out, not pull it out. So you start distally where the small bowel has telescoped and start trying to milk the bowel out proximally. Um, this is a CT scan of a patient that has an interception. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, on, on the right hand side of your image, you have this concentric donut looking um, uh, circles and essentially what it's showing is that it's showing the cross section of one loop of bowel with another loop of bowel that has uh, caused complete obstruction of the narrowing which is the dark area of the lumen right in the middle of the smaller circle so and theoretically that should be very large enough to allow either air or gas go through and in this example um, at let's say at 12, one, uh, 12 to 1 o'clock position, you can see within the abdominal content, you can see those uh, black areas within the abdominal wall that represents air. And right below that, you can see a couple of sort of uh, much brighter white looking uh, uh, circular round uh, structures. Those represent the bowel that has oral contrast in it. And then when you get to the intercepted bowel, you can see that nothing is going through essentially. Um, this is an example of a barium enema, which, could, which is not only diagnostic, where you diagnose the interception, but it could also be therapeutic. Um, you can see when you start from the bottom of the image going to the top, there, there seems to be a, a, a cone-shaped structure that comes to a point before it goes to the, the to the larger circular area where there's a white arrow pointing to. So that represents the narrowed segment of the intercepted bowel going in. What's important to actually appreciate on this is that is as soon as that bowel intercepts into the, the larger ring where the arrow is, where it's marked by arrow, you appreciate that there's very little contrast into it proximally. And the reason why you have more contrast, uh, I'm sorry, distally, with the reason why you have more contrast on top of this image than the bottom of this image is because this contrast was given um, sort of uh, through the rectum where it had reflux back into the small bowel. And you can appreciate how the bowel has intersuscepted itself and not much of it is going on the opposite direction. So this patient would essentially would have required to go to the operating room. Um, any questions on this? I am going to go to the next one slide, and then I will open this up for a couple of notes that I've taken that I uh, from sort of, uh, today's clinic that I want to talk about without having prepared the slides for it. Um, 
the slide sort of speaks for itself. Duodenal switch and nothing else. Duodenal switch operation is not the same as SADI, as the loop DS, as the single anastomosis duodenal switch or the SIPS procedure. Um, we quite frequently, routinely will um, get either inquiries or call from patients that uh, have are either having some issues, they have not lost as much weight, where, well, I had the DS, but it was done with one thing, it's the same anastomosis and so forth and so on. The, the duodenal switch operation is a well-defined, very clearly described procedure. It involves a sleeve gastrectomy component, and it, in, involve, it involves transecting the duodenum and creating two parallel limbs where the biliopancreatic juices are brought down to the distal small bowel. Interchanging the terms of the duodenal switch, SADI, loop DS, single anastomosis DS, and the SIPS with the duodenal switch operation is misrepresentation to say the least. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't know if we, there's a way to do this, but this, this presentation will go to our, uh, to our website and uh, you folks can uh, sort of review this information if you wish to. That link takes it to a graphical representation of how the differences between the SADI and the SIPS procedures compared to the duodenal switches. And um, as I always tell uh, patients that come to us is buyer beware, make sure every patient is clear as to what they're getting themselves into, what kind of procedure they're having, and what the, what, what the surgical options are. Uh, and uh, again, just on this one slide, I want to be very clear. It's very important that we appreciate that the duodenal switch operation is a very well described procedure. You cannot interchange the terms duodenal switch as to, well, I sort of had the duodenal switch, but it was looped or it was a SADI or a simple or a SIPS procedure. Um, there's very little information about long-term outcome of these procedures. The short-term data suggests that the SADI and the loop DS have sort of similar outcome as far as the weight loss is concerned early on. But we also saw that with the sleeve gastrectomy. So I would venture to say that maybe some of the early weight loss that parallels that of the duodenal switch is primarily from the sleeve gastrectomy component, not from the duodenal switch component. And so saying that a SADI or a loop DS has the same outcome as the duodenal switch may be premature. Um, uh, th there are some uh, patients that have had the SADI and the loop DS procedure some time ago that have that are reaching out and they're sort of um, having to have it revised to the complete duodenal switch because it doesn't work long term. But this, may, you know, that doesn't make it science either because it just didn't work for those few patients. What happens long term? Who knows? Just uh, buyer beware. Um, uh, if there is no question on this, I'm going to just have, uh, continue uh, talking about uh, a few other items. Um, we've talked about this issue uh, f previously um, a, a few times. One of them is the issue of the uh, relationship between vitamin D and parathyroid hormones. Um, the hyperparathyroidism, which is the hormones that re the, the, which is the hormone that's secreted by the gland that sits behind the thyroid gland, is the one that's um, sort of the regulator of the calcium vitamin D metabolism, and a normal vitamin D level uh, on laboratory reading does not preclude or eliminate the possibility of the patient having hyperparathyroidism secondary to low, low vitamin D. Um, let me explain the context of that. A, a patient comes back and they had elevated vitamin D, uh, I'm sorry, elevated parathyroid hormone and a low vitamin D and they were given vitamin D supplements in the form of injection within one or two months and their numbers stabilized. And now they've been told by their primary care that they may have some tumors of the parathyroid hormone because their parathyroid hormone tends to, uh, is still abnormally high. Well, uh, the point to be made here is that though just because your vitamin D level is normal, um, that doesn't mean a patient has parathyroid tumors the time will normalize parathyroid hormone 
with normal vitamin D level. Patients need to have normal vitamin D level for a relatively long period of time in a matter of months before the parathyroid hormone levels normalize. When and if after a relatively stable time frame of few months of vitamin D level, a patient's parathyroid hormone stays high and it does not start drifting downward, then it may be prudent to evaluate the parathyroid glands by doing an ultrasound of the neck to look for parathyroid glands or doing a system EB scan, which is a functional study to evaluate the function of the parathyroid glands. Um, these, uh, in general, most of the primary parathyroid disease problems, uh, parathyroid adenomas or hyper, hyperplasias, which are the two types of it, are um, more often than not benign conditions. But uh, universally, majority of the patients that we see in our practice and weight loss surgical practices see um, hyperparathyroidism, which is abnormally high parathyroid levels, go hand in hand with low vitamin D, either acute or chronic in nature. And vitamin D levels need to be controlled long term before the parathyroid hormone will start swinging in the normal range. So no need to sort of get all uh, worried or concerned about having to rush and get a neck surgery done because of an elevated uh, parathyroid gland. Um, the uh, other question was, that had come up today was the importance of or, or the need for vitamin uh, B12. Um, vitamin B12 is important in patients that have had gastric bypass operation as a, because the stomach is bypassed, uh, the vitamin D B12 deficiency occurs frequently. That is not a factor in uh, dual switch patients. Our patients do not have to be on vitamin B12 supplement unless the laboratory studies uh, show on. And um, when it comes to, you know, the typical question where this comes up is in the context of, can I have vitamin B12 injections to sort of get another five pounds of weight loss? I would recommend against it. There is very little evidence that actually that sort of um, uh, long-term works other than maybe messing around with the metabolism. Um, most of you have heard this frequently, and I'm just going to repeat it again. Protein needs to be taken in small volumes. There is no such thing as a big protein sort of atomic bomb. Small volumes of protein are the best way to take it, and frequent, frequent small volumes of proteins is the way to normalize your protein intake. Um, protein deficiency develops slowly over time, and it will be corrected slowly over time. So... Um, that's why the best way to avoid getting into, into trouble with protein malnutrition is to um, start taking protein as early as possible and try to formulate our long-term dietary intake in a, in a way where we actually benefit from the protein um, uh, as, as our primary source of meals versus sort of a supplement to it. Um, the last thing that I have on my notes here is... Uh, seems to be the, another common topic that I hear is this chronic use of antacids such as, uh, you know, the, the famous purple pill and the PPIs. And um, uh, if I heard correctly recently, there is a, um, there is a um, move uh, to pushing the FDA to actually rigorously tighten and, um, highlight the significant downside of long-term use of the PPIs, the purple pills, which as surgeons has been obvious to us for years and years and years. There not only is potential for nutritional issues such as iron deficiency anemia and sort of uh, locally it will damage the lining of the stomach, but also masks potentially irreversible damages that can be caused to the lining of the esophagus uh, where a uh, surgery to fix that may have been um, the solution. The patients get their symptoms masked uh, long-term. Um, the Hashimoto's thyroiditis is a condition whereby, um, if, uh, this is a question that's, uh, that's asked, um, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, 
um, is where a, pi a patient's uh, body um, creates antibodies and attacks the cells of the thyroid. So um, it's a hypothyroid state, um, but not in the true sense. Hypothyroidism means when the, my thyroid is not functioning. And um, in that case, what you have is a, a, a higher level of thyroid stimulating hormone, the TSH, which is secreted from the pituitary, goes to the thyroid and instructs the thyroid to dump up all of the uh, thyroid, the, the, the T3 and T4. And um, there's a loop mechanism that goes back to the brain and tries to control the, the, the thyroid secretion. Um, when it comes to um, uh, hypothyroidism, for a number of reasons, there may not be adequate secretion of the T3 and T4 from the thyroid gland. So because the suppression is at a lower than normal, that increases the secretion of the TSH. So a typical patient would represent with a very high TSH level, low T3 and T4. This is a typical hypothyroidism. In Hashimoto's thyroid, is interestingly enough, the T3, the TSH from the hypothalamus is secreted in relatively normal range. The T3 and T4 are secreted in normal range. So on the surface, the numbers are sort of in a normal range. The problem would be would be that the patient has a high uh, thyroglobulin, which is the, the antibodies against the cells. So even though a patient may have enough T3 and T4, they're not functioning properly. And the, the way to address this would be some sort of a suppression and even thyroidectomy to remove the gland, to remove the source of the antibodies being, uh, being able to attack the thyroid cells. And then the patient has to go to um, uh, uh, thyroid supplementation. The um, uh, I don't know of any direct correlation between Hashimoto's thyroiditis and any vitamins uh, the, and the metabolism or, or, or metabolic supplements that the patients after weight loss surgery take. So that was a question. Um, uh, question is, what do we take uh, for GERD, Gaviscon, TAN, uh, or TUMS? Uh, I think the key would be to take medications that, um, A, first and foremost would be to identify what the cause of the reflux is. If I'm having too much reflux because I had uh, uh, too much of pepperoni pizza and uh, you know carbonated drink and chased it with a Kit Kat bar, then I should probably stop doing that and not immediately eat and lay down. Um, so you know that needless to say, it's sort of the, the the dietary basis for this. But if there is um, uh, anatomical issues, if there's things like hiatal hernia, if there's increased abdominal pressure because I've gained too much weight. And you will sort of see this in patients that, uh, for example, are also uh, have had pregnancy. Pregnancy tends to increase the abdominal pressure. Uh, patients that have had abdominal plastic paniculectomy, increasing the abdominal pressure will force the stuff sort of up and down, so and I'll develop reflux. So those are things that you sort of have, one has to consider. Um, and in those cases, temporary course of um, even Prevacid, Pepsid, Nexium is acceptable. I think the the the, the thing that we're trying to uh, 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 avoid would be for patients to say, "Well, I've had this reflux for 15 years, and you know, or 10 years, and here I'm just been taking this for the Prevacid for 15 years without really evaluating as to what the cause of it is." So, um, in the terms, when it comes to treatment of um, GERD. I think number one would be to identify what causes it. And we talked about some of the anatomical, dietary, you know, onion and uh, coffee and, uh, you know, uh, spicy meals and so forth and so on. You know, high acidic food, you know, citrus and all that. Any of those things needs to be eliminated. And then if that doesn't resolve and I'm still having little symptoms, then maybe I should be evaluated. Interestingly enough, again, you know, looking from our, our practice's perspective, we have seen a fair amount of patients that have had sleep gastrectomy done that have developed um, reflux disease. And this has to do with the fact that um, by nature of some practices, the sleeve, sleeves are done in a, a high pressure, low environment sizes where the sleeve is made very small because 
in some practices where they only do the sleeve, they have to do as tight as possible to make sure the patient loses some weight because they don't have the luxury of falling that falling back on the dual no switch component. And these patients will have this very, very tight, small stomach that essentially extends from the esophagus down through a small opening into the stomach and everything gets caught in there and then their patients have reflux. So that's an anatomical explanation as to why those patients need to have something done other than just giving them a purple tail and hoping for the best. Um, uh, the, the difference between a hiatal hernia repair and uh, a Nissen fund application is that in a hiatal hernia repair, you sort of repair the um, opening where the esophagus goes through from the chest cavity into the stomach, into the abdominal cavity. And if you have enough stomach in an intact GI tract, then you take the stomach and wrap behind the esophagus to create a, a washer to prevent from the stomach slipping back up again. In patients that have had sleeve gastrectomy, duodenal switch, or even prior history of hiatal hernia repairs, and we cannot do the Nissen because there's not enough fundus left to wrap around the esophagus, we will do the hiatal hernia repair. But in those cases, we will put a biologic mesh. We will, to, uh, we will play some sort of a mesh that over time may re- dissolve or actually stay in and have that act as a barrier, as a type of a washer to prevent from the, um, from the stomach slipping up again. Um, the magnesium level, the, um, I have also read that too, uh, as far as I know, it's still the best way to check for the magnesium level is the serum magnesium level. Um, I'll have to sort of get back and sort of, uh, go back, but I have come across some patients that for one reason or another. A very few that will insist that the magnesium needs to be checked in a particular way. Um, but as I said, the standard way, you know, in any hospital, you go to a standard way to check magnesium is just serum magnesium level. Um, any other questions? Very good. Um, if there is no more questions, there is. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Oh. <laughs> what do I want for Christmas? Healthy patients and healthy family. All right, a Kit Kat. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, and we'll see you next year.